Thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk here today. I was asked to really reflect on my own um, aspects of my own career development in the context of history of psychology, psychology of women, and stories about psychology. This might be more of a story about psychology than something which says all that much about women in psychology, though I will reflect on that from time to time. Um, it is, nevertheless, a story of how things that happen to, in your career can happen for what one might say is all the wrong reasons. I just think that I have been extremely lucky in a number of ways, and I will talk about some of those elements of luck. I was in the right intellectual and geographical place at the right time to do the things that I've done. And I also attribute a great deal of my career success to following my heart rather than my head. Um, and I think that that's what people should do. Um, I do think that there may be just a little bit, which you might add, at a kind of personal level, which I also recommend, which is kind of having a, an open mind to seeking opportunities rather than dwelling on obstacles. So I think that there may be a little bit of that. But I'll talk a little bit about the luck um, and the following my heart rather than my head and put that in the context of some developments which have influenced the kind of psychology that I have done and the kind of psychologist that I am. So here's some luck. I didn't want to go to Cambridge University. I had been at a girls' school. The last thing I wanted to do was to go to a woman's college. Unfashionable as that might be today, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to go to a new university, and I had got offers of places at York and Lancaster and other places. But when I won a place at Newnham College, my father handed me a box of chocolates, and under the lid was a five pound note. Now, I am not easily bought. <laughs> Five pounds in 1970 was a lot of money, and we were not a very wealthy family. And I realized that this was really important for my dad. So I went to Cambridge. Before I went to Cambridge, I finished the gap year, the beginning of which I'd done my Cambridge entrance. Um, they hardly had airplanes in those days, so you didn't fly around the world. Uh, I was a computer programmer at Procter & Gamble uh, in Newcastle. I was a computer programmer when there were scarcely computers. I spent six or seven months of my life trying to program, and interestingly, trying to program analysis of variant statistical programs to analyze the, the things that made a difference to the, the height of suds as a result of the different ingredients in washing powder. <laughs> the computer that I programmed filled a room nearly as big as this, and it had a total of 16K of storage. <laughs> you can imagine the things that I learned about information processing constraints before I ever went off to study science at Cambridge, at which I was hopeless. So I went off to be a chemist, and I did so badly in my first year in all the subjects that I was supposed to be studying that I had to find some different subjects in my second year. And I was very lucky to pick up experimental psychology as a second year subject. And experimental psychology in the early 1970s was about human information processing. Well, I knew about information processing because I'd been a computer programmer. And I kind of got it. And I got it, and it got me. And I fell in love with that kind of psychology and have been in love with it ever since. But it was more than the more general approach to psychology that was, in a sense, lucky for me, and that the, the, the information and, and experience I brought to my studenthood. During the 1970s, psychologists were rediscovering the fact that people could remember things visually. We had been absolutely trapped by verbal memory, not even verbal memory, because you couldn't study memory, verbal learning. And then all of a sudden, in the 1970s, psychologists began to publish things on the astonishing capacities of visual memory and picture memory. And at the same time, during the 70s, there was a great deal of concern that people who tried to remember faces of 
people they'd seen commit crimes could make mistakes. And there was a great deal of concern about eyewitness mistaken identification of faces. So we have this beautiful paradox. People are apparently astonishingly good at remembering pictures, and astonish including pictures of faces, and astonishingly bad at remembering the faces of people who'd done crimes. And there was this paradox, and that kind of opened up a field within which I have worked most of my life. But then there are other things which are kind of lucky that happen to you. The people you meet, and when you meet them. So, probably in the early 80s, I first met Andy Young, an extraordinarily distinguished psychologist who is currently at a meeting down the road where I spent some time this morning, so I have many apologies for not having been here early this morning. But Andy Young and I, who have published a number of things over the years together, discovered that we had grown up, both of us, in Whitley Bay, Northumberland. So here's a picture of Andy and me gambling on the beach. <laughs> we grew up in next door streets, and we used to go to school on the same train. In fact, his sister was uh, at, at my school in my class. Uh, and of course, when we met, I was in Nottingham and he was in Lancaster, but all of a sudden you have this forged um, friendship, you know, shared memories. And I'm sure many of the things we've done together, we've done because actually we quite like meeting in Mark Tony's in Newcastle and, and remembering our shared childhood memories. So there's a lot of things that kind of impact on your uh, career. So more luck in terms of the scientific opportunities that presented themselves and into which I was able to make some uh, contribution, I think. There was this startling paradox in the early 1970s. Faces of good, face recognition is good in the lab, face recognition is bad in the field. But at the same time, there were a number of applied areas beyond the forensic and security, which meant that people, industries, were interested in face processing. So forensic um, applications, security applications, communications applications, why, well, you know, why isn't a, a smartphone conversation FaceTime the same as face-to-face? -face? Surgery, can you simulate surgically the effect of a particular corrective operation on somebody to see how that face perception might change. All sorts of things, which actually have meant there's been funding for work in the field of, of face perception over the, uh, the, the time that I've worked on it. But at the same time, technology advances meant we could begin to do, I will call it good science, in a field where you couldn't do very rigorous science when all you could do is to manipulate faces with, with scissors. Um, I can remember when I was started doing my PhD in Cambridge, I stayed in Cambridge doing my PhD and Alan Badley was my supervisor at the Applied Psychology and eventually I moved over there. But I can remember talking to Fergus Campbell, the most distinguished fellow of the Royal Society physiologist in the uh, Downing Street building and he was asking me what I was doing my PhD on and I said, I was working on face perception. This was at a time when people who worked on visual perception often worked on gratings, very, very simple patterns. And he listened attentively and patiently. And he said, well, Vicky, I can't, I can't uh, copy the accent. Uh, the face is very interesting, but I don't think you can do a whole PhD on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a time when people were not working on natural uh, pictures and images very much in a scientific way. But the technology advances that, that came in at the same time allowed us to do much better experiments on face perception. Um, and then I will talk about some of the personal and uh, career uh, peer networks. But, you know, actually you can do some interesting things with scissors. Um, most people here will have seen this. Um, but if you look at this picture of Margaret Thatcher, it, it just looks like Margaret Thatcher upside down. If you turn it the right way up, you'll see that actually that is an image of Margaret Thatcher to which somebody has taken a pair of scissors, and the somebody was Peter Thompson. Now, what it was that took Peter Thompson in the late 1970s to take a pair of scissors to a picture of Margaret Thatcher <laughs> on a Friday afternoon in his laboratory, one can only speculate. <laughs> Nevertheless, by doing this, he discovered a rather important illusion, which is now called the Margaret Thatcher illusion, though, of course, it does work with faces other than Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> which demonstrates that we process upside down faces differently from the way that we process upright faces. There is something in the way that we process upright faces which 
puts together the different parts of the face. We process them as wholes or as um, global configurations, turn a face upside down, and we see things much more in parts. So if you turn that, that version of Margaret Thatcher upside down, actually what you've got is perfectly good Margaret Thatcher eyes, perfectly good Mar Margaret Thatcher mouth, perfectly good Margaret Thatcher hairstyle, and your brain just says, oh, that's Margaret Thatcher. Because what, what the brain can't do with the upside down face is to see that those things are not configured correctly. So you could do interesting things with scissors, but you could do much more interesting things once you could begin to do um, computer-based manipulations of faces. And these slides, as with all clever slides, are produced by other people. <laughs> these slides are produced by Peter Hancock, with whom I've, I've worked um, uh, um, many years in Sterling. And this is showing how you can morph images of faces. Um, this is Peter Hancock's face. This is Robson Green. Um, and this morphing technology, which everybody can do now, you know, you've all got, more, most people have got morphing softwares and you can all do it, but the morphing software technology was developed by Dave Perrett and others at St. Andrews as part of a collaborative program of, of work that I was involved with, though not on the computing side, in the 1980s. Um, and it's good fun, as long as you mark up the same points on different faces that you want to average together, so you don't try to average together Peter Hancock's nose with Robson Green's mouth, so you need to have coincident points, and then you can come up with the average location of those coincident points. So this is the average, uh, the average nose length of those two faces. And then, of course, that's not a very good face. So you need to carry the texture with you. So you do that by joining these points and having little triangles. And there is the average little bit of forehead between those two faces. And then you do this. Oops, sorry. So now we've got something which is halfway in between Peter Hancock, as he then was, and Robson Green, as he was then. And if you're not absolutely sure that that's the average of those two faces, note at that time the untroubled brow of the contemporary academic <laughs> and the worry that is writ all over the forehead of the person trying to make a, a living in the media. And now you've got an, a kind of half-worried brow there. So once you've done that, you can actually, if you want, you can have a nice morphed sequence. So you can have your Hancock with a touch of Robson Green, or your Robson Green with a touch of Hancock, and you can produce very precisely controlled variations in faces. Now, when I did my PhD, I was desperate to be able to find faces for scientific reasons that were like halfway in between Harold Wilson's face and Edward Heath's face. I couldn't do it then, you, you couldn't do it. But you could begin to do these things once you had this morphing technology. And then you could do all sorts of things on the perception of uh, the gender of faces, the perception of identity of faces, the perception of expressions, which involve these very precise manipulations. And many of the people with whom I have collaborated, and many people with whom I haven't collaborated, have done some really excellent uh, work on the perception of faces using these kinds of computer graphic techniques. So you could begin to do much more precise scientific manipulations of the images of faces once you had computers that were a lot bigger and cleverer than the 16K computer that I was programming in 1971. But the people are just as important in terms of your uh, individual development. And we had a really strong faces communi community in the early to late 1980s. I guess the particular group that I'm going to identify now probably worked together directly for about 10 years, but it was the 80s that was most important. And this group um, was quite an interesting group. We, we all got a program grant together uh, where we had different projects at different universities, so hence the people I'm particularly um, noting here. Hayden Ellis, uh, Cardiff, sadly no longer with us, a terrible, terrible uh, loss. We were very, very sorry when our friend died uh, a few years ago now. And Young, aforementioned, Andy Ellis, both at Lancaster at the time, Dave Perrett and his group, uh, St. Andrews, uh, myself and uh, other, at the time, more junior uh, people working with me at Nottingham, uh, Ian Craw, Aberdeen. So this particular set of people who are named here, we, we had this, this group of projects um, jointly funded from, from the ESRC. Now, in the 1980s, we were all 30-something. Interestingly, we weren't directly competing with each other for promotion or advancement, and I think that's one of the things that made collaborating very, very straightforward. Um, we all ended up doing very nicely. Um, now, interestingly, of this set of people, there weren't any other women. Of course, this talk got me thinking about this. 
That was rather common at that time, um, and I'm going to touch on it in a moment. But I just want to say, as well as the fact that we were all at a particular junior stage in our career, working on something where there were some fantastic scientific and applied opportunities and contexts, so it was a great field to be getting in, in with, also the world worked differently. There were some benevolent elders in committees in ESRC and elsewhere who kind of noticed these young things and kind of would say, oh, you know, it might be £2,000 for a seminar if you ask the right person at the right time. It doesn't work like that anymore. But we were helped and assisted by more senior people who kind of noticed that we were trying to do stuff and sometimes suggested places we could get small amounts of money from. But anyway, when I started to worry about the fact, and I did worry about the fact, you know, here's a bunch of guys and I was a woman. And what was it, you know, actually, was this the sort of, what was it like? Actually, this was the first ESRC work funded workshop on face recognition at Grange over Sands. And anybody who knows the faces field knows the significance of the Grange meetings and those who don't, don't need to be bored by that. What I'm going to focus on is the picture. Um, here's the, the set of people who were at that workshop and most of them are men, but there are some women. Um, if you look at the women that I know that you can identify as women in that picture, there's Amina Memon, with me, and we haven't changed at all. <laughs> Rona Flynn, Ruth Campbell, and this is, I've forgotten her first name, McQueenie. Now, I'm not quite sure what she went on to do, but these are the women that I can see and identify. Of those women, four out of five ended up in chairs. Of the men in that picture, about 80% ended up in chairs as well. So if you look at the set of people who were around at that time and how well, admittedly small sample, et cetera, how well they went on, there seems to have been very similar career advancement. And that's a pleasing thing to have noticed on my part. So I'm, 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 I'm happy with that. But as I say, isn't it amazing how time is so kind to us? Um, <laughs> and fashion, you know, the dungarees are back in fashion now and I wish I'd kept them. Um, <laughs> There were other important role models and mentors, people not within my own field directly, and I did want to mention them. Some are women and some are not women. The first and most important person in my entire career, and I really wish I'd got a picture of Arj way back. I have had one or two email uh, exchanges with him in recent years. I should ask him for a picture. I make a joke about doing very badly in all my subjects first year at Cambridge, but actually I wasn't very happy about that, and neither was the family. And I was lacking in confidence in my second year. Arj Sargol was the postgraduate student who was my tutor called Supervisors in Cambridge, who marked my first and all the essays in my first term, possibly even for the rest of the year, I can't quite remember. And Arj picked up my first essay and said, Vicky, that is brilliant. I don't know that it was at all. But to be encouraged <laughs> and to have somebody encourage you at a point when you're lacking in confidence, that's something that, that really role models and mentors do for you. And I hope I remember to do that at least some of the time with the more junior people with whom I work. He also, he went, the reason I've got this little thing with him on a scooter, I remember he went round on his scooter the night before all our exams, all the people that he, in his tutor group, and he went round to the colleges that he was supervising and checked that people were all right and were they worried about the exam. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, there were women in the Cambridge department when I was an undergraduate. Uh, Alice Heim was there, but the most important um, influence on me at that time was Sue Iverson. And Sue Iverson, most distinguished woman who has now retired from her um, duties in Oxford. I can remember when Sue, she was probably about 30, was advising me about things that I should and shouldn't do beyond the undergraduate thing. And she was leaning against a desk at the front, the most heavily pregnant woman that I have seen <laughs> giving me advice. So in terms of having a, a role model at an early stage of a woman who could, you know, hopefully combine their family and career well, there was Sue. And she gave me very wise advice and always has given me very wise advice. Um, at the Applied Psychology, Psychology Unit, as then was, both John Morton and Alan Badley um, played fantastically important roles. Alan was my supervisor. Um, fantastic that he is still working and publishing at York, and I see him quite often. John Morton was a really important influence as well. I can remember absolutely tearing my hair out with some data that I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand how to explain a particular pattern in my data. 
And he came and he looked over and I said, oh, it just doesn't work. I can't, you know, if I, it doesn't work. That logic doesn't work to explain it. And that logic doesn't work to explain it. And he said, yes, and that's one page for your PhD explaining why that doesn't work. And that's another page explaining why that doesn't work. And now you need to work a bit harder coming up with an explanation that does work. <laughs> but to be told that the, the things that didn't work as accounts were part of an argument was actually very important. But then when I was later in my career, and I was beginning to be invited onto um, research funding bodies, I spent some time on the Grants Committee uh, when it was chaired by Gillian Brown, and some time on the MRC Neurosciences Board when it was chaired by Ingrid Allen. And to watch these two women with very different styles get a rather complex, multidisciplinary, largely male group of people to reach decisions on time and to finish an agenda was a very, very important thing, because at that time I wasn't being exposed to women in very senior roles, and it was through the research councils that I saw these women doing these very difficult jobs in very different ways, <laughs> very different personal styles. So I, they all gave me lessons which I hope, some of which have, have made a difference. During the course of my career I moved um, from university to university, almost all for personal reasons. Um, I moved to Nottingham from Newcastle, uh, where I had a, a temporary job after my uh, PhD, uh, to be near as Sheffield, which I wanted to be near at that time. But that was very lucky, going to Nottingham, because it was an applied department with lots of applied strands. And when I was at Nottingham, the then head of department, Ian Howarth, uh, got a letter from the uh, Royal Mint saying, um, we, ha we would like some psychologists to evaluate some new coins, but we can't tell you what the new coins are going to be. Coin X. And uh, Ian Howarth was quite a directive uh, chap, said, I'd like you to do this, Vicky. <laughs> um, so I did all this work on um, human factors on, uh, on the coins. And I have to say, uh, we did make a difference to the pound coin. I'm a little bit sad to see it change, just so it marks the end of an era. We, the pound in your pocket was a little bit fatter than it would have been because we discovered that you needed that extra thickness to allow it to be distinguished um, from other coins circulating at the time. And probably that has more impact, that finding had more impact on more people than anything else I've ever done. And that paper uh, has been cited three times. <laughs> But it was good experience working with industry. Very good experience. Then I moved to Stirling from Nottingham because I wanted to live in the Scottish countryside um, and I wanted to get a different work-life balance. Ha, 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 as I say in the next slide. Uh, I moved to Edinburgh to be vice principal. That was the one that was a kind of career head move and it was the least, um, uh, in some respects, the least satisfactory move, though it worked out all right in the end. Um, and then I moved back to Newcastle a few years ago um, from Edinburgh, largely for family reasons, though there was a job to be done in Newcastle. Um, it, that wasn't the primary um, motivator. And I, I, that's why I've moved in the way that I have. But I want to say a little bit about Stirling, which was absolutely the happiest time in my career. Um, I was completely naive about the nature of the move. Um, I remember Colin Campbell, who was the then Vice Chancellor in Nottingham, saying, if you move to Stirling, you'll be a great big fish in a small pond. And I thought, well, that sounds quite nice. <laughs> um, but actually, I hadn't realised, because I was very naive. I mean, senior people do well often to protect more junior people from some of the political stuff surrounding their, their, their duties. And I, I hadn't really clocked things like research assessment exercises and gradings and funding or any of that sort. I just didn't realize. And I moved to Stirling at a time when it was, did not have a very strongly developed research infrastructure. But I had the opportunity in Stirling to help develop the research infrastructure for the university and, and was deputy principal for research there for many years. But all of a sudden, you, other things happen. Other, there are other consequences. So I was suddenly hugely in demand for other people's committees and roles because I was female, because it's a time when people want to actually get more women onto things but not just because I was female. Because I was a Scot, i.e. located in a university in Scotland, but I was a Scot not in Edinburgh. <laughs> so all of a sudden you get to tick a lot of boxes and I got asked to do a lot of things and I did a lot of things and I was very busy. I enjoyed all the things that I'd done and I have, was as well when I was in Stirling, 
surrounded, and this is a really important and relevant point here, surrounded by interesting and supportive women. And one of the reasons I think Sterling was the happiest time in my career was because of the context within which I was working in senior management. I have to say this context, which was for the last two or three years that I was there, arose in part for a very sad reason, because one of the other deputy principals became very ill and, and, and died, and, and we had to shuffle the roles a bit. So it was partly because, um, because of that. But we did end up, I think, for the last two or three years that I was there, in this very interesting and possibly unique um, senior team, where the chancellor of the university at that time was Diana Rigg. <laughs> My father was very, very jealous. <laughs> Uh, and she was banned. So Diana Rigg was the Chancellor. The Chair of Court, which was the governing body in, in the, the Scottish context at that time, was Doris Littlejohn, an extremely eminent and interesting um, uh, uh, HR lawyer. So she was a lawyer. We had three deputy principals, me, Sally Brown, and Christine Hallett. And there in the middle, cowed, was the principal, Andrew Miller. But I just think that's just such a nice, it was such a nice environment in which there was an extraordinary over-representation of women in senior roles. These things don't happen very often and they haven't happened, they haven't persisted in, um, in that university or in others that I've, I've worked in. But it was, it was an, a, a good context within which to work and I think probably Andrew would agree it was a good context as well, at least I hope he would. Um, I sometimes when I talk about my career, because you get to a point where you're either being asked to talk about the history or you're being asked to talk about your career because you're not, because you can only reflect backwards. I sometimes am asked, yeah, but have you done the stuff, stuff you've done only because, you know, you haven't had any children? No, I haven't had any children. Um, but I, di I have worked with and I'm friendly with a number of very senior women who have had children, and I absolutely now I'm delighted that that women um, can succeed and go all the way to, in, to the top in in, in our discipline, d despite carrying with them quite um, uh, significant um, uh, parenting responsibilities. So um, these are friends of mine and um, peer role models, and I have I could have produced many more, but those are three particular uh, particular close examples. Um, I thought I would just reflect on what it is like, I think, to, to be a woman in academia generally, um, with or without the kids. Um, I do think women are still asked to do a lot more things and can get over-exploited. I think it is still the case that people are trying to, you know, even up their representation and um, and I quite often advise more junior colleagues, well, don't do that just because they want to get another woman on that committee. Do it because you want to do it. Um, but that does, but it still means that it is, I think, quite a good time to be female because a lot of places are trying to recruit more women. I think that balanced values that many women bring to the jobs that they work are often valued now. Um, and there has been a lot of change in... in over the years that I've worked in uh, psychology and in universities, but it's not pervasive. Uh, I went to a dinner with the Leverhulme Trust last, trustees last year um, in the context of, of something or other, and I was very surprised because at that point all the trustees of that body were male. And I was really surprised because I don't very often go to contests. I mean, they, they had noticed and they were trying to do something about it, but it was... Um, so I think things are, as I say, quite, quite good for for women now, but we have to be careful not to be overexploited. Um, but given this kind of experience last year, um, I just thought I would balance the books with this uh, photograph, which I'm very, very fond of, um, though I wish Amina hadn't closed her eyes. Um, so, so this was at a conference a couple of years ago now, and uh, we, this group of four women, discovered that I was an academic great-grandmother. I had supervised Amina's, Professor Amina Memon's PhD, and she had supervised Professor Fiona Gabbard's PhD, and Fiona was supervising Ashley doing a PhD at that time. And I just thought that was a really nice thing. I'm so pleased to be able to, be, to, to see these successive generations of women in psychology. Um, and as I say, if only Amina had opened her eyes for that particular shot, but that was the best that we did. 
Right. I will finish with just some very, very uh, superficial reflections um, of possible relevance to the history of psychology and psychology women's se section of how things have changed. When I started out, although there were women in the departments that I was in, I mentioned Alice Hyam and uh, Sue Iverson at Cambridge, at Nottingham, uh, Elizabeth Newson, there were always women in fairly senior roles. Each department had a single male professor, head of department, and those roles were kept in what appeared to be perpetuity. Um, now, most departments have kind of management committees and rotating responsibilities, sometimes appointments from outside. But I think that there's more consensual approaches to decision making at senior level than, than there was in some of the, the, uh, the departments I was um, either a member of or have been aware of. And I think that's good. So I think leadership styles and models of management have changed in a way that allow most of us to participate more. However, women are still overrepresented in some roles in universities, for example, as directors of teaching, PVCs for teaching, and completely underrepresented in other words, for example, PVCs for research. And this is one of the things that actually I do find um, a bit upsetting. So when I was in the deputy principal role I was in, uh, vice principal role I was in in Edinburgh, uh, I would sometimes go to the Russell Group PVCs for research meetings because we sort of took turns which of us went to it. We didn't really have somebody in quite that role in Edinburgh. And there were virtually no women in, in those roles. And, and that worries me because it means that perhaps some of the things that Jan was talking about and others have talked about in terms of you know, valuing broad, broader and different approaches to research and styles of research and things are not getting reflected necessarily in some of the, uh, the leadership of research. So that worries me a little bit. In psychology as a discipline, my interests in face recognition, face perception, sit in the middle of a sort of span between vision science on the one hand and things more to do with social cognition on the other hand. And when I go to experimental psychology meetings as well, there's, there, there are kind of communities who work more on vision and others who work more on things like language sciences. It is quite noticeable to me that there are different still intellectual styles in different sub-disciplines, and some attract more women than others. And um, certainly if I go to a vision sciences meeting, which I don't tend to, it has a very different feel from when I go to a more general experimental psychology or social cognition meeting. So there are still sort of different... Uh, different areas of the discipline within which women either select to work more or flourish more. I don't know which. Um, but finally, back to serendipity, I, I was really lucky to study psychology when I did, with the background that I did, and it was a very good time <laughs> to be a woman. Um, so I, I sort of end by just uh, saying I hope, you all, I hope you all have the same kinds of luck and opportunity in your careers that I have had in mine. Thank you. Mm -hmm.